Hello and welcome to the next instalment of our Security Middle East magazine Fireside Chats. I am uh, joined today by Dr. Tom Winston, who's a Director of Intelligence at Dragos, who's going to be taking some questions around um, Dragos's fifth edition of their year in review, um, which contains some really insightful observations, really, on cyber threats, um, vulnerabilities, assessments and incident response observations. Um, so, Dr. Tom, thank you for joining us. I mean, I'm going to do the, the quick intro. Um, so, Dr. Tom is a cybersecurity subject matter expert, um, and he's got a lot of focus and time spent on, uh, on really profiling and understanding threats to critical infrastructure, um, such as ICS and SCADA systems, as well as foreign cyber threat intelligence and threat analysis. Um, He's got significant and extensive public and private sector experience in the IT and the OT threat environment space. Um, looking at different areas though, like threat hunting, detection engineering, and reverse engineering too. So Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, I'm, I've taken a look through the, uh, the uh, Dragos' um, report and there's some really interesting pieces in there, but, um, for me, 2021 seemed like a, a pretty dramatic year in terms of disruption. Um, and if you were to summarize just some of the biggest disruptions that made the headlines in 2021, what were they and, and how did they occur? What were the kind of, kind of ways that, uh, that attackers managed to compromise these organizations? No, it's a great question. And we, uh, one thing that we've noticed, we've, and this is something that's been a common problem for a very long time. I was a cybersecurity practitioner long before I was um, spent the last 10, 12 years in ICS OT security. And one thing, one thing that is really critical is the relationship between the IT networks and the OT networks. And one thing we've certainly seen um, in 2021 and, and even uh, into half of 2022 is a couple different types of things. There's there's really two sort of categories of, of um, adversaries uh, working against you know our, any critical infrastructure at any given time. Um, there's the accidental adversaries, and that's when the IT when the IT attack in an unintentionally affects operational technology. Um, we saw that with Colonial Pipeline. We saw that with a few other um, ransomware attacks, JBS Foods, United States, um, and actually South America. And then there's there's the more directed, targeted attacks um, like the Stibnite, um, Camasite type, Wasonite type attacks um, that we outlined in the year in review um, as the active as the activity groups active in 2021. Um, and it turns out that Camasite is actually still very active in 2022. Um, so there's there's a continuing trend of sort of in of this this division of um, whoops we stumble upon an OT network and this is an attack tailored specifically for an OT environment. And this is this is sort of the um, the devil's in the details because uh, ransomware attacks are generally they're IT focused. Um, and we saw with with um, the, the, the colonial pipeline attack that there was uh, you know a lot of second, third, and fourth order effects on logistics systems, processing systems, distribution systems. And it's not, um, we always, we, we, we kind of look at them as unintended versus intended. Um, what we would say is an intended attack is something um, like uh, Wasonite or Camasite that appears to be, you know, deeper into the ICS kill chain level one or level two, um, where there appears to be process manipulation. One exception though to this would the um, Oldsmar, Florida water incident that occurred last spring, um, and it's, it's detailed in the year in review as well. Uh, that was uh, an attacker of some sort using old IT infrastructure to access um, deep portions of the operational technology, uh, manipulating an HMI, adding a, a dangerous amount of sodium hydroxide to a water supply. Um, fortunately, in that case, though, even remotely, there was uh, an engineer watching that, and the engineer was able to affect that in real time. But if I think back, if I, if I think back to 20 years ago, when um, the sort of the big buzzword in IT was uh, in, in security was firewalls and 
um, you know, sort of packet filtering schema. Uh, it, it's just changed so much. Um, and the, the adversarial activity really, uh, every time I think it's gonna slow down, um, there's something else happening in a different sector. And we've seen, we've seen a really, really uh, broad interest um, from ransomware act actors in the manufacturing sector. So, and it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing because the question has been raised many times, why manufacturing? Why, why not something else? Why not oil and natural gas? Why not electric? It's because the manufacturing sectors seem to have the most integrations with um, enterprise IT environments, you know, sort of in the field. And by that, I mean, in, in, in the factory floors, in the processing plants, in the, in the logistics and distribution plants, there, there, there tends to be a, a little more of a, you know, deep connectivity there. And it, it's not, it's not that um, IT operators are, are trying to design poor, poor weekly secure infrastructure. That's not the case at all. It's just, they are very different. Um, those types of technology are very different. And um, sometimes if, if we were to dig deeper, if we were to look at operational technology and we were to say, well, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the thing that they're doing in operational technology that, that, that they're not doing in information technology? I would argue that in IT, um, most deployments are tested, field tested, prototyped, um, patched on a regular basis. In OT, it's a little different. Um, in OT, it's a lot of hardware. It's a lot of things that can't be patched readily, quickly, or easily. Um, and deeper into operational technology infrastructures, it could require reprogramming or even up, you know upgrades in the equipment, um, new equipment. So there's, there is a bit of a difference um, between those two those two types of uh, infrastructures. Great, thank you. A lot to unpackage there, to be honest, with, um, with that opening uh, opening statement. But um, so what what we've been looking at, at the ISF as well is. Um, a real convergence of OT and IT and an ICS as well. And you mentioned their ransomware. Um, it's, it's clear it's a prolific threat, but do you then perceive ransomware as a, as a bit of an inevitability then for, for OT environments? Do you think the manufacturing industry is just gonna be hit very, very hard throughout 2022 and beyond? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't. I, I won't make a prediction as to whether the attacks will increase or decrease. Um, I think that there is fertile ground there for adversaries to sort of do research and development, find find ways into the manufacturing sectors. I definitely think ransomware is going to continue to be an issue. Um, we've seen ransomware groups appear, disappear. Uh, we've we've heard some instances of ransomware groups being, you know, arrested, sacked by their countries where they're operating. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the technology that they were using or the tools that were, they were using disappears completely. And one of the most difficult things I think tracking um, ransomware adversaries is not just the way they change their TTPs, but um, sort of the way they stumble into different um, sectors across the board. Uh, you know, there's been hospitals that have been hit. There's been all, I mean, everything ranging from um, medical to manufacturing uh, to, to oil and natural gas, as we saw last year. So I think the target set is very broad for ransomware. And um, there's, there's just been, there hasn't been a downtick in the activity. The activity, I would argue this year has changed from what we saw last year. And that change, um, it seems to be that the, the organizations that are getting hit um, seem to have actually more of a broad base than they did last year. Last year, we saw a, a, a general focus in the manufacturing sector. Um, this year, we're hearing about other sort of ancillary uh, operational technology environments getting compromised by, by the, the ransomware. So I, I think it's going to continue to be a problem. Um, I think organizations, if they take stock very carefully of uh, you know, their, IT, their enterprise IT and operational technology overlays, if they look carefully at how they've digitized certain portions of their, their factories, their manufacturing environments, um, what, what have you, production environments, logistic environments, I think that's a good place to start. Um, it would be nice to not have the ransomware problem anymore, but the ransomware problem really um, in the last three to four years has just become a greater and greater issue. It started out with uh, primarily IT systems. And of course, in the last couple of years, we've seen much more in, in the industrial control system sectors. 
absolutely. Um, you started off talking about intended and, and unintended threats to, to OT. I think some of the information within your uh, report kind of highlights some of the threat groups to look out for. How do you prepare for unintended threats then to, I, to OT and IT? Like, is it, again, I'll use the term inevitability to it, because uh, it seems to me there's such complexity in the supply chain. There's a range of entry points to an organization now. So what do, what do you think about that? Would you, would you mind elaborating on the unintended consequences? Yeah, it's, um, that's a great question. Really, it's vigilance. Um, you're 100% correct. There are many vectors by which um, attackers can access an infrastructure. Uh, for instance, we saw with the solar winds, this was just through a basic software update. So software can actually become the adversary working against your organization. Uh, and you're right, the supply chains are incredibly complex now. Um, I think it's vigilance. I think it's a matter of uh, you know understanding your assets in your organization, uh, especially in, in the control system, the ITOT, you know, the ITOT sort of bridge, as well as the assets within the OT organization, if you have full visibility on what's happening to them, if you're aware of what's happening to them on a daily basis, if you're keeping logs, if you're auditing those logs, if you're watching sort of the, the, the potential entry points, um, a lot of times, for instance, a data historian may be placed in a DMZ so that others can access it in the organization or ranging anything from marketing and sales all the way down to the engineers. Um, things like that need to be just vigilantly managed carefully. And it's, it's really a matter of basic, you know, basic best practices. Keep, keep watch, uh, be aware of what you have, be aware of what, what, how what you have is working and functioning on a daily basis. If suddenly you see a device deep, you know, layer zero, layer one of the Purdue infrastructure model, deep in your operational technology environment acting strangely, it could be, it could be a malfunction. It could be old equipment, or it could be something else. But it has to be, somebody has to take the time and investigate it. And the biggest issue I think culturally is that um, operational technology, operational technologists, or operational technology engineers and industrial engineers have a very different mindset. That they're they're about efficiency, um, proper functioning, operating within you know specific, specified guidelines, uh, whereas you know, IT actually knows about some of these threats, but IT sits on the other side of, of the transom. So they, they don't really, uh, they're not really necessarily communicating. So that's another issue too, I think, is uh, just communication between the two organizations. Um, sit down with your engineers and say, well, what do you know about security? And what do you think is happening? Are, are you porting, you know, proprietary protocols like DMP3 or something over ethernet? Is there something happening that, that we need to be aware of or that could be a problem? So just just uh, really uh, sort of, I mean, it's a very, very broad risk management approach to looking at the environments, but I mean, it's a start. And is it going to be perfect? No, it's never, it's never, ever going to be perfect. Um, there, there is always something coming that, that inevitably, as you, the term you used, um, will cause some sort of disruption or problem. So it, with that in mind, it's also a really good idea to have good sort of, um, you know, response plans in place, incident response plans in place, so that you have the right people addressing the problems in real time. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And then on the, the other side of the coin, the, the intended attacks, a lot of focus within this report looks at new activity groups and the, the most prolific groups, especially focusing on OT um, and ICS. Now, we at the ISF, our risk assessment tools look at motivation, so the motivating factors behind why an attacker would go after your organization. Why would attackers now pivot towards OT or critical national infrastructure um, instead of, say, financial services or insurers that seemingly have more money? What's in it for them? It's a really interesting question, and it's a very complicated question you just asked in a few, in a few very succinct sentences. Um, nation states or non-nation state affiliated uh, adversaries will devote time, effort, energy, and resources to um, looking at ways to disrupt critical infrastructure. And it could be, it, it could be used as a, as a diplomatic lever, a policy lever in those countries. Um, it could also be just part of a new program to look at 
something that hasn't been really considered for the last 20 years. Uh, let's 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 look at a country's curve limit structure. Um, let's see, you know, what we what sort of things we can do. And, and nation state adversaries have they have the time, they have the resources, they have the capabilities and, and the ability to train um, their you know their actors to basically do um, this very well. Uh, take some of some of the some of the things we've seen that that appear to have been developed over a couple of years. And we see, um, for instance, uh, Coastabite's a new threat group that we're, we're looking at, and there's a couple others, Camasite's an existing threat group. We see those adversaries um, retooling, re, uh, changing their attack infrastructure as, you know, as more detections are added to environments, as the defenders do their jobs well, um, we see them adjusting their TTPs. And that's that's actually something that always concerns us because that is a concerted effort and a concerted focus. Um, as for the reasons, uh, many nation states are interested in um, economic sort of espionage. Economic espionage is is, is a big deal. Uh, so, causing disruptions to supply chains, causing disruptions to distribution uh, chains, can actually be a pretty powerful tool. Um, in sort of, if we were to call it, I, I, I'm reluctant to say this, but uh, a, a very highly charged um, cyber threat environment, which we seem to have these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned there just finally around the, the cyber threat environment and um, just looking through the report again, it, it seems to me that manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, transportation, mining, all of these big player markets are, are going to be experiencing more and more ransomware, more and more threats. I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball, <laughs> if you don't mind, but it's clearly supported by um, statistics as well. If, if the threat landscape continues on, on this trajectory, what do you expect the impact to be throughout Q3 and Q4 of 2022 and, and beyond? Um, I, I expect that this, the sort of the, the tempo the operations tempo of attacks in these areas is going to not change. It's going to continue probably at, at a steady state. I think the best part about this question, though, is that more people are aware. Um, companies like Dragos are making more, more of these manufacturers, other ICS verticals, oil, natural gas, electric, making them more aware of these threats. Um, so this, this actually helps to prevent it from getting maybe rapidly increasing, uh, maybe growing to a point where it's out of control. I, I, th I do know though that um, nation states have a definite, in a definite interest in um, espionage and critical infrastructure. So I think we might also see, we may not see a huge increase, but we may see the breadth of uh, infrastructures that are being sort of attacked by adversaries, whether it's ransomware, which we would call an unintended consequence or an intended consequence um, like a you know threat group like Wasanite or Camasite or Kostovite, um, we're going to see that probably increase a little bit in, in scope and coverage. And that could be for two reasons. That could be because the adversaries are busier, or it could be because there's more visibility. Um, maybe as, as the sort of the ICS OT world becomes more aware of, of what can happen, they will find more things. So it it's hard to say if that's if that's actually happening or if it's actually um, there's an uptick in adversary activity. Um, so it's it's an interesting question because as you educate more and as as we, we sort of discuss these things more um, globally, we find that people will say, "Oh, we we had no idea that that might be happening," and then they do some research in their infrastructure and they're like, "Oh boy, we have something <laughs> happening here." That that and we saw this with some of the incident response. Um, that's detailed in the year in review, uh, we, we saw some of these things where people were actually not aware that there could be something um, that bad happening to their environment. So it's a it's an interesting sort of balancing act we're playing here. Are we are we are we catching up to the speed of the adversaries or or are we just seeing more adversarial activity that's been there for a long time? It's, it's always a question. No, definitely. I think one of the key words that I've taken away from a lot of these conversations that we've been having with CISOs as well and CIOs is resilience. And um, I think resilience is underpinned by a number of strategies. And one of the strategic steps that I took away from the report was visibility of the network 
and understanding attacker behavior more. What, what kinds of strategic steps do you think organizations should take to improve their visibility of the network? What can they do? And again, that's a great question. It's, uh, it's asset visibility is always really at the center of this resilience conversation. Um, asset visibility might mean to one person seeing all the assets on a map. It might mean to another person seeing the assets on the map and understanding exactly what's happening on those devices uh, inside you know, the very lowest parts of their uh, operational technology infrastructure. And I think that's, that's one part, understanding what's happening on those devices, keeping track of what's happening, developing strategies to respond to incidents is one asset, uh, one aspect of, of uh, visibility, I'm sorry, resilience. Visibility in the sense of understanding how the system of systems is working, understanding how the system of IT system, uh, whether it overlays directly or not directly with um, the system of OT, um, you know, sort of devices and sort of maybe security enclave, what, what have you. Um, understanding that is, is a really important thing as well um, for resilience and understanding the activities that uh, operators will take to sort of interact with that system. Are they accessing remotely? What's the access control schema looking like in the organization? Is there multi-factor authentication? If, if we have individuals working from home to monitor various parts of the infrastructure, um, how are they accessing that part of the infrastructure? And then what can they access once they access that part of the infrastructure? Um, so just really sitting down and looking at how that system of systems is working is critical, I think, to developing a policy of resilience. Also communicating and, co and, and having conversations with um, the various stakeholders in, in both sides of the organization, the enterprise IT and the operational technology organization is a really good start. I mean, even you may not know that, that you know, that those, those PLCs are using some protocol that actually ends up outside the firewall, which it probably shouldn't. Um, you may not know that, but having a conversation about that is, is, is a really good thing. Um, there's a lot of really bright people who work on both sides of, these, of this equation in the operational technology environment, and the enterprise IT environment. Um, and getting those bright people together, I think is, is really critical for a plan of resilience. You know, that coupled with uh, policy and procedure uh, as far as incident response, um, how are we going to handle this? What's the escalation level um, or the escalation procedure? And do we care about, uh, you know, the compressors and valves? Does, does the person sitting uh, monitoring the web <laughs> security care about the compressors and valves deep in the, o the OT infrastructure? They probably should, at least in, in terms of understanding uh, what that does and how that interacts with their environment. Yeah, awesome. Um, the the one kind of fi final point you had there was around incident response, and in the report, there's some really interesting lessons learned from incident response that you that you at, at Dragos has, have seen. One of the uh, messages I took away from that was uh, it says in, in the the report here that a key point is that while preparation ahead of an incident is always core in IT or OT. Incident response is much more important in OT incident response because of the unique nature of the environment and questions to be answered. So what, what, what do we do? How do we improve incident response, crisis management, business continuity and disaster recovery? And you mentioned some good things in, in that previous response as well about getting the right people talking to one another. Um, but, but just to sort of summarise, what, what else is there that we can do sort of before an incident and then having playbooks in place. What are your thoughts? Um, I think it's important for organizations to, to run scenarios, uh, tabletop exercises in, within their organization to say, okay, what, what do we do if we have ransomware in this, this part of our enterprise IT? How will that affect our OT? Um, just running scenarios is a very helpful, uh, it's certainly, it's always a very helpful way to sort of um, test your incident response plan. Um, having the incident responders understand those nuances of connectivity or nuances of data transfer and exchange between devices. And this isn't exactly, I mean, this may not be easy for somebody who, you know, comes in from the enterprise IT world. They may look at a PLC and they may say, well, this, what are we, what, what am I looking at here? Why do I care about this code? Um, it's, they're, they're a little bit different. So it's almost, a, it's almost like you have to have um, not just the OT, incident responders there, but also the IT incident responders. But more, more critically, 
your question was, why do we have to react more quickly in operational technology environments? And the answer is very simple there. Um, if you stop processes that um, are capable of building up heat or electricity, and they continue to build up heat or electricity without properly dis diffusing or dispersing that, um, you, you end up creating what could be a physical um, danger for, for the folks working in those environments. And that's, that's something that fortunately we don't see very often, but it, it's not only theoretically possible, there have been instances where um, you know, physical harm can come to an individual. There's been a couple instances actually in the Middle East where this happened uh, probably, let's see, going back 10 years um, where there was physical destruction of hard drives in an organization. Um, there was, there was an, an adversary who caused that to happen. With operational technology, because there's physics involved, um, it, it always sort of changes the stakes because the people working in that environment, they may not be aware. That it's, it's possible that they, they wouldn't be aware of something going awry. Um, and th there could be somebody in the enterprise IT environment who, who, who basically says, oh, wait, we have something happening here. This doesn't look okay. Um, so that's why it's always important to have some you know, security system in place, but, we, but we've seen attackers um, go after that security system, the security instrumented systems, the things that are stop gaps that prevent physical destruction from happening. Um, we've seen them go after that in the TRISIS attack uh, the, from, I think it was 2018, 2017 timeframe. Um, that, that was an, an instance where they were actually going, uh, the adversary was working very hard to disable um, something that would protect human life. So that's why, that's why the, the stakes are always a little different. Um, and yeah, Colonial Pipeline was a bad situation because there was logistics and distribution uh, calamity, um, but there wasn't, a, there wasn't necessarily a threat to, uh, you know, the, the individuals working in the organizations. Uh, it, was just, it was just bad for everybody who was trying to get their fuel delivered. So um, there is a, there's just a difference. Uh, it, it's always a little, having a server go offline versus having a, a you know, critical process, you know, fail is always a big difference. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, look, Dr. Tom, we're, uh, we're out of time um, now. I, I could chat to you all day about this. I think there's so many different vectors and, and threats to talk about and a ton of really insightful um, incidents that we've seen um, and that Dragos has uh, observed. Um, I would definitely recommend to anyone listening to, to download the, the report and take a look and 100% and explore the Dragos website and, and take a look at the really good work they're doing. In, uh, in protecting ICS and OT. So um, Dr. Tom, thank you so much for your time and thank you to everyone listening today. Thank you very much, it's been my pleasure.